resist my mic. Okay, thank you so much, Professor David Flasher. Hi, everyone. I'm very glad to be here. Do you hear me well? So hi everyone, uh, very glad to be here with, uh, um, with you to share uh, some, uh, a, a, a small overview about uh, in, uh, an introduction to global health. Um, thank you for inviting us, um, our, my colleagues, my colleague Professor Jean-Michel Aupère and uh, myself in this uh, program and this is a historic day because it's the first time we can talk about our newly born Institute for uh, Global Health, uh, newly created, and, uh, and the project has been accepted October 1st at uh, Sorbonne University. And I would like to publicly thank Professor Juan Fernando Ramirez for building such a great uh, project and, uh, and gathering talented people um, with whom we're going to do uh, um, a lot of things and a lot of work. So I'm Françoise uh, Guillot, I'm a medical doctor and uh, I'm the head of the Students' Health Department at Sorbonne University. And uh, the reason I'm here today is in my, uh, I'm a hospital practitioner and in my former life, I had the opportunity to uh, uh, create and teach a, a, a course on global health, an introductory course at New York University in Shanghai with uh, students from across the world. Chinese students and chi chi um, students from Ecuador, Ukraine, uh, United States, France. And uh, these two courses, Introduction Plus and Advanced Course, launched a global health track, has been uh, still going on uh, since. Okay, so global health is a vast field of interest, work, and knowledge and research. And we're going to talk about uh, many, many topics. It, it's about many, many topics. Of course, we're not going, we are not going to uh, talk about every topic today, but just take a look. And I would like to start with values here. I'm not sure you can read, but it's about values. It's about education and skills. It's about human rights, about healthcare delivery, about climate change, water, biotechnology, digital communication, migration, um, global governance, climate, and, uh, about, sorry, uh, cities and organization. And of course, the, the field of work is uh, shifting demographics and, and uh, lifestyle, environmental health and climate change, and um, global health governance, of course. So I, I would try to focus on this uh, a few um, elements. So what is this uh, um, talk about, um, briefly? So we're going to try, but not to dwell too, too long on the definitions, because global health is pretty much about reflection and action. And uh, a little bit about history of global health, geography, about what's happening. So I will take two or three examples, the uh, demographic transition, climate change and its repercussion on health, and the global burden of disease. Uh, the goals, what can we do for global health, in global health, and how do we reach these goals? How to reach, sorry, a typo, and a, 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 a minimal conclusion. So, what is global health? Just talk a little bit about definition. There are many, there are, uh, and there are more or less, it's more about a global point of view, um, and there a global perspective on challenges, issue, impact, solutions, and response on many fields. Child health, chronic diseases, maternal health, injuries, emerging diseases. Is it a notion, a term, or a century old of public health? It's more or less an area of study, research, and practice that places a priority on improving health and achieving equity for all people worldwide. This is one of the definition and bear in mind that essentially global health is a multidisciplinary, multi-sectoral field in which the diverse partner from around the world together, maybe together is the most important world, uh, to improve population and environmental health. And, um, okay, so we, if you want to interrupt me, 
many disciplines involved. It's not exhaustive, but uh, geography, of course, history, medicine, epidemiology, statistics and data science, politics, politics, economy, anthropology, philosophy, climate science, maybe urban, urban planning, so many, many disciplines. About history of global health. History of global health is, global health to me is the, the grand granddaughter of the um, colonial era medicine that evolved into tropical health, that evolved into international health, and here we are in uh, talking about global health. Why are we talking now and when uh, did we start to use this term? So the term appeared in the 50s, but really uh, was uh, widely used starting in the 90s, and it took off in the, it, it, like 20 years, 25 years ago. And it was very um, concomitant with huge progress on the global level in the field of health. And maybe the reason why this term just took off is because we are more and more at any level and every person. And we saw that during the COVID pandemics, that health is only, is essentially, a, a glo has to be envisioned globally. Okay. Um, a major challenge coming from history and the colonial era, I think, that we have to bear in mind that we must decolonize global health and avoid the uh, unique um, north-south perspective. There has been really a frame for many, many uh, intervention, uh, research, and so on. And major achievement in the past 30 years uh, ex life expectancy has doubled during the 20th century and uh, since the 60s and 70s, thanks to a lot of uh, international programs and uh, vaccination alliance and, and development, uh, we have eradicated a few diseases uh, and uh, um, a lot of uh, diseases have been, um, the, the incidence has been going down, uh, tuberculosis, and we, we have uh, seen major improvement. This was going along with development, of course. It was not only the global health field that did a lot of things, but we have seen a lot of huge achievement. Take an example with, w, uh, with uh, HIV. HIV was a pandemic in the 80s. We knew very few things about the virus, where it came from. Also, the virus was discovered in, 20, uh, 20, um, in 1927. But here it appeared as an emerging disease and here we are, so uh, almost 20 million people have been infected <laughs> since the 80s. And now we have uh, um, medication, we have research that is uh, transforming uh, what happened, that uh, there was a lot of deaths, a lot of orphan economy destroyed in some countries where the, the, uh, the prevalence of the disease was very important. And now, thanks to global health, um, a program, for example, the 1990 rule. We have, 1990-90 uh, rule, I will explain. We have at, at least roughly 75% uh, of people being infected by HIV treated. And amongst uh, these people, um, uh, at least 60% having an un undetectable viral load, meaning that we can stop the transmission of the virus, stopping from mat mother to to a fetus, to baby, and between, um, between people. It has not disappeared. Uh, there is no way to cure HIV, but here we are, and we are no longer facing, facing death um, uh, related to HIV. The 1990 rule, it's a goal that we are gonna explain that we want 90% 90 uh, 90 of person infected by the virus diagnosed, among these 90, 90 treated, and among these, these people, 90% with an undetectable viral load. So this is one of the important achievements. From public health to global health, so a little bit of uh, like um, notions comparing public health, international health, and global health. About geographical reach, um, public health is, you know, the public health doctor is the GP of a community, being a nation, being a community, a university, for example. He has trans global health transcend national boundaries. The level of cooperation is global, uh, whereas the, the different scope of global health compared to others. 
many challenges. I'm not going to list all of them, and I, I'm pretty sure you know a lot of these challenges. So poverty and health inequities, climate change, conflicts and effects on population health, migration, that can relate from that, reducing threats from current and new diseases, tuberculosis, drug-resistant tuberculosis, but also Ebola, Marburg, coronavirus, etc. And still ongoing issues that are not completely solved in many places, like food security and clean water. And we have this new, very, uh, very new shift that occurred in the 20, 30 past years. It's this demographic transition and its epidemiological consequences, aging of the population. The burden of non-communicable disease, which is now the group of diseases that is uh, responsible for the most of the deaths and the burden of diseases. New infections, we talk about later. Talking about geography, so we talk about geographical reach, a lot of specificity are related to geography. Uh, in public health, for example, and in global health priorities are different if we talk, uh, we're talking about Arctic countries, uh, sub-Saharan tropical uh, uh, countries in the African continent, vast population like in Southeast Asia, and, um, and or mountainous area, and we are, bear in mind always this important notion which is access to health. And access to healthcare and prevention health system are facing very different, um, very different challenge according to the, the uh, uh, situation, uh, the geographical situation. Also, we have different governmental orientation and policies, and also this difference uh, coming from um, ethnic, religious, and cultural disparities among nations different philosophy, and within nations. Access to health care can be completely different within a nation uh, depending on the minority of the ethnic group you belong to. This is really extremely well um, studied. And see here, it's, uh, I'm not sure you, you see that, it's in Guatemala and a specific et et um, a lady from a specific uh, ethnic minority has trouble finding um, a, a hospital that she, she wants to give for um, birth delivery. Gender disparities is not only related to geography, but it has a lot to do at place because uh, and the health of women <coughs> and girls. So health of women and girls is a key area of action and research and action. <laughs> Uh, worldwide and uh, in some places in some country it's most it is most pregnant it's most it is much more difficult than in others so we will go to uh, to that later I'm going too fast now it's okay okay so talking about uh, uh, inequalities being related to uh, many, uh, many different um, uh, um, contexts. For example, we have, this is, um, well, sorry for the source, but it's from the former Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which is a private uh, foundation, uh, um, has been quite generous in fi financing programs in global health, and they're comparing a white male, Bill, a white American female, um, Melinda, I know they are separated since, and a little girl, uh, we don't know her age, but maybe eight years old, uh, born in Salian, Sub-Saharan uh, African region. And we have this level of, this uh, area of geography, demographic, shocks and fragility, social economics, and governance. So for a, a white American male, governance, it's 2019, was not really an issue. It's a democratic country with uh, like the health system it has, but you know, a lot of uh, infrastructure. Shock and fragility, it's not, it is, but it's not comparable to um, sub saharan region. <laughs> Look at this, uh, this little girl, she's facing a difficult area because uh, uh, drought, uh, um, water resources, agriculture, 
um, gender issue, race, religion, age, climate change. The sub uh, Salian region is bearing a, a heavy burden from climate change. Income, education, access to services, and governance, lack of uh, political stability, governance, health policy, health systems. And uh, where our Melinda is just facing, according to this diagram, issues because she's a woman. Not going down. Okay. Uh, understanding poverty. Poverty is also a huge challenge, and um, it's related to geography somewhat. Half of the world poor live in just five countries, and half of the poor are children. <coughs> and the, also, the number of people living in, in extreme poverty has uh, dramatically declined since the uh, year 2000 almost, and it's expected to decline. We saw reverse during the COVID pandemics. So it's still fragile. Around 800, um, 800 million people live in, uh, in extreme poverty. You are all familiar with the uh, World, Bank, World Bank classification region by income level. So this has a lot to do with economy and maybe a lot to do with geography and maybe a lot to do with history too. But here we are in many uh, places where um, we can level some uh, degree of action. We are seeing uh, many countries in uh, the uh, um, lower middle income and low middle income bracket here. Southeast Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. Okay. Just one word about social determinants of health. Maybe are you familiar with that? Okay. It is very basic uh, notion. So the social determinants of health. Uh, it's a neighbor you grew, you you were born in, and you grew in um, your your social bonds and community. <coughs> your education, access to education, economic stability <coughs> around you, and of course, access to healthcare. Is there a hospital? Is there a strong health system? Is your neighborhood fostering good health and good uh, and healthy habits or environment? Are you living in a polluted area with no access to healthcare and a, a very historically destroyed community? So these are the social determinants of health. Talking about disparities and inequalities, um, just sitting, uh, citing this um, article about income and child mortality uh, in developing countries. So um, the GDP per capita is related to uh, the level of child mortality. In which way, in which mediate, mediation, sorry, mediation, by f what we call female literacy. So if girls are well educated and go uh, as long as possible uh, um, at school, they're gonna have their ch children later, no early pregnancies. They're gonna have a better, what we call health literacy, understanding prescription, and being able to take care more wisely of, um, of their um, babies and children, and being able to uh, have a, a job, maybe a paid job. So this is all about, it's. A Pivotal education in girls and, and women are really uh, uh, essential to foster any kind of progress. <coughs> About geography and biodiversity, the deadliest, deadliest animal in the world is the mosquito, killing, killing roughly uh, 100,000 uh, uh, human per year because it's uh, what we call vector-borne diseases. It's uh, the vector of many um, viruses, West Nile, chikungunya, dengue, yellow fever, Zika, and also parasites like malaria. Second is human. So what's happening in the field of global health? 
We're going to talk about the uh, global burden of study and the demographic transition, and it goes along with the epidemiological transition. And I will say a few words about climate change and health because uh, we don't have much time. Um, how can I? So this is a, a, a wonderful source. It is the IHME, which is the um, Institute for Health Metric and Evaluation. It's an initiative from Washington University, Washington State University. And uh, it's been an on ongoing data research. And uh, the study is called the Global, Global Burden of Disease Study. And this is a, a comparison. So we were talking about different burden of disease. We have three different categories of diseases. The blue, the red, and the green. The blue one is what we call non-communicable diseases, which are mostly chronic diseases, cancer, vascular diseases, ischemic uh, heart disease, hypertension, diabetes, COPD, pulmonary disease, chronic uh, um, obstructive pulmonary disease, Alzheimer's disease, dementia, uh, osteoarthritis, all these chronic diseases. And in red, what we call uh, communicable diseases, maternal and neonatal, um, which is lower respiratory in infection, tuberculosis, diarrhea, malaria, HIV, neonatal issues. COVID-19, because this, uh, this um, study is for the, uh, I took the year 2021. And in green, we have everything that is related to injury. Injury, self-harm, violence, violence, falls, drowning, fire, road traffic injuries. So now, I just selected um, um, the causes, uh, sorry, the causes of death. We get back to the global burden of disease later. What I wanted to show you is that uh, according to the uh, age bracket, you're going to have a, a different burden. Of course, uh, if, you, if we are talking about uh, children under five, we are seeing much more neonatal and infectious diseases like diarrhea, lower respiratory infection. Uh, rather, and if we uh, select the age bracket over 65 or 50, we're going to see much more uh, vascular diseases, chronic uh, uh, neurological diseases, cancers, etc. Okay? Okay, so. Is it clear like the non-communicable diseases, infectious diseases, and maternal and neonatal? And so we'll, you, you'll play with this uh, this GBD compare. It's absolutely uh, amazing. Okay. So we have this demographic transition and the epidemiological transition. It's describing the shift in major, major causes of death from infectious disease towards uh, chronic and degenerative ailments. And I put a little vignette about dementia, Alzheimer's disease. Uh, Alzheimer's disease is going to be a huge uh, burden of disease especially uh, when we go further in time and uh, it's gonna uh, expect it to tri triple to 152 million by 2050. Okay, est-ce que je peux fermer ça, non? Oui, tu dis, continue, je m'occupe de la technique, je vais mettre dans un coin, je vais faire... Talking now about <laughs> about the demographic transition. The dem demographic transition here, what do we see? We see a huge shift in the share of population over 65 here and the uh, population under five, number of children under five. And this shift occurred re quite recently in roughly 10 years ago, 2014. And it comes along with a striking decline in fertility rates.
Okay. So the demographic transition is a long-term shift of birth and death rates from high to low level in the population. And the decline in mortality normally occurs first, leading to a period of rapid growth of the population and before fertility rates start to fall. This is the last projection of the um, 2024 United Nations Population Division. And it's, uh, um, the, uh, um, these are the projections for people over 80, uh, roughly from um, now to the, uh, the end of the century, 80. And uh, <laughs> sorry. The decline in fertility level is expected to reach like 70% of the population worldwide uh, below the replacement rate from 2.1 uh, child per woman in her life. We are a little in between now. Another way to look at the total fertility rate, yes? Um, I was just <coughs> not sure if you know, um, do you know roughly at what point um, world population is expected to start declining? I'm sorry, at what point? Uh, you mean the world population? It is expected to plateau around 2017, 20, uh, uh, 2100, the end of the century. Another way to look at the uh, decline of the fertility rate, it's everywhere, not only uh, in, so we are seeing that in the south of Europe, in Japan, in Southeast Asia, in the uh, former Soviet, uh, Soviet Union countries, Eastern Europe countries, we are seeing that now in Africa. Uh, African continent still being the youngest and with a median age of 18. Happy birthday, but it's still starting to decline and reaching here by the end of the century. So a change in uh, age pyramid from the 50s to uh, 2017 and ballooning with, you know, look at people over 60. And um, so less uh, children dying, they are reaching the age of five, but people grew older and still here. Um, okay, let's talk a little bit about climate change and global health. So projections are dire and reveal a dangerous future. This is from uh, the Lancet countdown. If temperature reach two degrees Celsius, heating by the end of the century, and we are going towards this already by mid-century, we are not far. We could see 370% more heat-related deaths. We are already seeing this death. What, one, uh, 500 million additional people experiencing moderate to severe food insecurity, and 37% increase in the transmission potential for dengue fever which is a worldwide spread um, vector borne disease, disease. And uh, if you visit this uh, um, Lancet countdown, you can uh, uh, look at where the burden will be felt the most intensely. Again, about geography. But it's going up north for the dengue fever. I just put on comparison a, uh, sorry, a density collecting cartogram. This is carbon emission from uh, some continents between 1950 and 2000. And this is where the burden of four most rela um, climate change related diseases uh, here. And it's malaria, malnutrition, uh, flood related uh, fatalities, and diarrhea. Here, the emitters, the burden is felt here. Mechanism behind uh, health consequences from global warming is we have this greenhouse gas emission and the use of fossil fuel, which is also generating uh, air pollution and diseases related to air pollution. And so global warming, ocean acidification, uh, adverse weather events will call a range of uh, health consequences from undernutrition by the lack of cultural activity and physical, reduced physical uh, capacity, an impact on cardiovascular diseases through um, heat waves, for example, respiratory disease, vector borne diseases, and also, do not forget, social mediated issue like loss of habitation, 
poverty, mass migration, conflict, and other social determinants of health, and a huge impact on, global, on mental health. So what can we do for global health? When can you do, what can we do together? Maybe thinking of uh, uh, action, programs, collaboration, cooperation, and research. So talking about universal healthcare, about sustainable development goals, improving climate policies and regulation, and asking for a grand, conver grand conversions. For example, just an example for vector bone uh, comprehensive vector control, increased capacity, better coordination, improved surveillance, and integrated action. So there is room for research, program, action, and, and uh, work in, this, uh, in every field. About sustainable development goals, we are all familiar with that, 17 goals. Goal number three is related to all the others, of course. Uh, affordable clean energy, gender equality, clean water and sanitation. How do we get there? Education and research. Education worldwide at every level, school, middle, middle school, universities. Collaboration between for uh, education of health practitioners. Data collection, it's about primary data collection, health registries, and data analysis, innovation in health tech, artificial intelligence, cooperation, diplomacy, and scientific diplomacy. It's about policies and regulation. It's also about finance. How are we gonna finance all these programs? So this is from HME. HME. This is only related to COVID-19 in 2023. It's showing the flux of financing coming from different countries, different governments, through global funds, bilateral aid agencies, uh, development banks, and it goes to specific um, programs like surveillance, rapid response, risk communication, vaccines, uh, country level coordination. And if you go to this uh, IHME that I highly recommend, you can choose uh, the disease and the, the, uh, the specific topic you want to study. So there is uh, room to for improvement, place to work. Uh, there is an enormous payoff from uh, improvement and investing in health. A grand convergence that is merging the, uh, um, the um, uh, low-income countries and lower middle-income countries on the same level, so scaling up health systems, scaling, scaling up investment. Fiscal policies are a powerful, powerful and underused level for curbing non-communicable diseases and injuries, and progressive pathway to universal health coverage. This is about uh, uh, grand convergence. To me, in my point of view, and I think that's the reason we are here today, thanks to a new initiative for Sorbonne University and the collaboration with the University Technology of Compiègne. Global health is about commitment, it is about passion, it's about expertise and shared values. Thank you. So good, uh, good afternoon. So it's a, it's a great pleasure to be here uh, this afternoon with my colleagues, so Françoise Guillot and uh, Juan Fernando Ramirez, who is online. And so uh, I would also like to thank David for his uh, invitation to uh, share with us uh, so a few things about global health, because this is our topic uh, today. So I'm lucky because actually I have two talks so the first one is a, is a snapshot about our institute. And the second one is uh, an example of a global health problem uh, related to nutrition, because I come from the field <coughs> of uh, nutrition. So the first thing is to talk to you about our newborn institute. So this uh, Institute of Global Health it's a part of uh, what we call Alliance Sorbonne University. 
and it's a, it's a new institute. It's an institute without walls, and so it connects a lot of uh, different uh, institutes. So, if I don't have the slides, <laughs> so this. Uh, <laughs> Okay, no problem. So the the aim, the, so the ambition of the institute is really to try to improve access to health, access to care, access to prevention, and to improve health equity. So this is our ambition. So if you read the papers these days, you can see that this is a really an important topic access to care and so we want to do this in in the field of uh, global health so this is my second uh, set of slides actually uh, yeah. yes that's the one yeah very good okay Hello? <laughs> okay, so what we want to do is to uh, facilitate communication between different disciplines. So this is very important for us and this is one of the, of the major aims of the, uh, of the Institute. So the first aim is really to facilitate what we can call transdisciplinary or interdisciplinary research. And, and this, is, uh, this is very important because you know that uh, in science and also in health, we usually work in silos. So the idea is to really break the silos. Thank you. Very good. <laughs> okay, so so we we uh, so this uh, so let's uh, so we rely on a on a network of uh, institutes. So we are what we call the Alliance Sorbonne Université. So Sorbonne University, as you may know, is is one of the largest uh, universities uh, here in France. And so we have the three faculties, so health, sciences, and humanities. And we work closely with Université Technologique de Compiègne, which is part of Alliance Sorbonne Université. We work closely with the Natural History Museum, which is a, a very important uh, scientific institute. We work closely with INSEAD, which is a business school in Fontainebleau. And we have also a network of international partners in uh, various parts uh, of, uh, of the globe, in Europe and also uh, in, uh, in the Americas and also in India. So these are the members of the Alliance Sorbonne Université that we work with in our institute. And we rely on this very rich network. Of course, Université Technologique de Compiègne is a major partner, of course, of course. <laughs> so what I told you is, so the, the aims are really promote new collaborations. So try to develop, hopefully, disruptive transdisciplinary research in global health. Support the production of new knowledge that will have practical applications, field applications, and this includes informing public health policies and working with decision makers. We have also uh, objectives to facilitate the setting up and the implementations of new courses, new training curricula in global health, and of course to communicate about the needs in global health and increase the visibility of uh, our Alliance Sorbonne Université. So we have a, a plan, we have a graded approach, so we will develop gradually 
both the research projects and the training uh, opportunities. So you can, of course, join us. <laughs> so uh, the Institute will be officially launched in uh, January next year, but hopefully uh, starting with a new university year in 2025, we will have uh, educational opportunities. So just to show you what we are interested in, in this uh, institute. So we heard from Francoise that global health, well, it's very general. There are so many themes. So we have focused on four major health themes. So these are our horizontal axis in our matrix. And these themes are themes of excellence in our university setting. So the first theme is health and environment, focusing on infectious disease. So as we heard, we have to differentiate between communicable and non-communicable disease. So infectious disease are the communicable disease. We have a, a line of, uh, of uh, research on autonomy, aging, and also vulnerability. So focusing on a life course approach, so healthy e aging, so chronic diseases, so these are the non-communicable diseases. We have a line of research on cancer and also on nutrition and health. And so nutrition and health, this is also a vast topic. So we are interested in the nutritional transition and also we have special interest in young adults such as university students. And so we are really relying on this very rich landscape, very rich network of uh, excellence in Alliance Sorbonne University. And then we have three vertical axes. One is the biomedical humanities. The second one is digital health and technology. And the third one is health economics. So just briefly, what is called biomedical humanities, it, it, it uh, associates philosophy, history, anthropology, sociology, so a lot of, uh, of uh, social sciences and, and humanities, working on different topics such as uh, what is the, the concept of global health. So we heard about the definition of global health, but it's so vast that we, we can also work on the concept of global health. The social and ethical implications of uh, technological advances, this is really important, and also work on the determinants of uh, inequalities and also communication. Then we have a vertical axis on digital health and technology, working on data collection, data analysis, interoperability of uh, data, access to data uh, and knowledge, and training. And so in Sorbonne University, there is a specific uh, initiative that, uh, that works with digital health and technology and also AI. And then we have health economics, so mostly through our link with uh, INSEAD, the business school in Fontainebleau. So I'm not going into economics here uh, in front of this audience, but just to tell you, so don't ask me questions about economics. So uh, just to tell you that uh, this line, uh, this vertical uh, axis will uh, deal with the health, uh, the economic implications of climate change, we heard how, how important it is for global health. Also for uh, the transformation of the pension systems, therapeutic innovation is a very important topic for health uh, economics, etc. So it's really our matrix. So this is to tell you that we have selected topics where we think we have really excellent science and we are going to work to try to connect all these different themes, the horizontal themes and the vertical themes. So I have a few examples, but I'm going to skip the examples, perhaps to 
to no 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 not yet not yet and so these are these are some of the examples so very briefly for example if we we keep our matrix and uh, for example we we will be interested in young adults young adults so 18 25 if you see what i mean so and how the living environment which is mostly an urban environment which is part of what is called the exposome. And some of this uh, age category, some of, of, uh, of the people in this age category have socioeconomic difficulties. So how all this does impact on behavior? So we're mostly interested in health behavior, such as food behavior, mental health, academic performance, and how we can link all these different uh, themes to provide solutions for this age uh, category. At the other end of, uh, of the life course, we're also interested in aging. We have, uh, we have uh, specialists uh, in aging in our institute. And so we're also interested to understand better how the sociocultural environment, together with the digital environment, can improve well-being autonomy and also uh, cognition in uh, aging uh, people. So these are the topics just to show that based on our matrix, we try to develop specific themes where we will have opportunities for research and uh, education. And uh, so we will develop uh, a master uh, in global health that will be uh, in Sorbonne University. We will uh, connect with other uh, global health uh, training courses, uh, also in Université Technologique de Compiègne. And so we will also have opportunities for training, uh, for example, in the health faculty with the University Diploma. And so we will have opportunities for uh, doctoral grants, a few, and postdoc grants also a few in the coming years on this topic of global health. So this is my presentation of the Institute. And now I would like to uh, talk to you about uh, uh, a specific example of a global health problem in the field of nutrition. And I would like to talk to you about the issue of uh, obesity because obesity is a, a kind of, of a very good example of a global health issue. It's a health issue, it's very much also a societal issue, and uh, <laughs> so we've, we've lost the slides, okay. Yes. It's good. It's my slides. I can talk on slides of other people, but these are my slides, yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, I'm going to discuss uh, about, uh, a bit about uh, obesity. So, oop. Okay, so uh, Francoise uh, explained about the non-communicable diseases. And uh, just to tell you that uh, it's, it's really one of, of, of the major global health concerns uh, today. And just uh, WHO to raise awareness about NCDs, the non-communicable disease. So uh, WHO has uh, promoted this, uh, this figure that every two seconds, someone in the world age under 70 dies of an NCD. So since we've been talking, uh, quite a number of people have died from uh, NCD. So NCDs, as, as you may know, have been categorized by uh, WHO, the World Health Organization, as the, the big four. So you have big, uh, sorry, four main NCDs and also four main determinants of NCDs. 
This is how WHO has promoted the concept for many years. So the four main NCDs are diabetes, cancer, cardiovascular disease, and also lung disease. So this has been heavily criticized because, for example, you don't have mental health. <laughs> huh. So it's, it's very clean here. Huh? <laughs> oh, it's, a, it's a nice space. Huh? It's, it's sunny, it's green. So these are the big four. And, and uh, one big issue is lacking here, mental health. And for the determinants, you have unhealthy diets, physical inactivity, excess alcohol cons consumption, and smoking. And here you have also something missing, which is obesity. So obesity is, is at the back of many of these issues, but it's not part of, of the picture uh, promoted by WHO. <coughs> However, if we look at, uh, at, at the main risks for global death, so perhaps you don't see this, but here if we look, this is in, uh, for females and this is for males. So these are data from uh, 2019. And here you can see the, the major risks. So the, if, we, if we look at the first ones, they are the same for men and women, but they are not exactly in the same order. So high systolic blood pressure is a major risk. You can see it's, uh, it ranks first in men and second in women. Then you have what is called dietary risks. So can be mostly malnutrition, but also uh, so obesity is, is categorized at another level. You have high plasma glucose, which means diabetes, air pollution, high body mass index, this is obesity, and then smoking. And you can see in women, no, this is women and this is men. These are the same first, but not exactly in the same order. But this is very interesting. So metabolic, what we call metabolic risks or dietary risks or nutritional risks are really ranking first as a uh, risk for, for death uh, according to these uh, data. Okay, so, so now I will focus on, on obesity. So why is obesity a global health issue? So because it has a global spread, and I, I will show you the, the data. It's a major health burden, and we will talk a bit about that. It's also an economic burden because uh, obesity leads to decreased productivity, to absenteeism, to reduce work capacity. So I'm not going into this, but this is a, a, an important issue. Obesity also represents a social burden, and there is this issue of stigmatization of obesity, which is a, a very important social issue. And then obesity is uh, determined by a multiplicity of factors and influences. I, I will describe a bit of that because I think it's really interesting. And this means that we need a multi-sectoral approach to try to tackle such a global health problem. So let's, let's start with a quick recap of uh, the definition w which is used uh, about obesity. So WHO has defined obesity in medical terms. You can have other definitions of, of obesity. You can have a anthropological definition, sociological definition. This is the medical definition. The medical definition is excess of fat mass, so adipose tissue in the body, which has negative health consequences. So there are two parts of this definition. And this has been uh, promoted as the definition of obesity by WHO. This is a very, very simple uh, figure about obesity. You can see that quite obviously increased fat mass, increased body weight depends on an imbalance in 
energy expenditure and energy intake. But this is all only the mechanics. It does not tell you the factors that can influence energy balance and lead to obesity. The factors are, of course, related to behaviors, so our diet, our physical activity, but there are also biological factors, and they are, uh, at the top here, a uh, very strong influence of what we can call socioeconomic factors. So obesity is defined very usually by uh, the body mass index, as you may know, just to uh, remind you that body mass index is weight in kilos divided by height in meters. For example, for a healthy person, 72 kilos divided by 1 meter 80 divided by 1 meter 80. This is the body mass index. And this gives approximately a body mass index of 23. This is my body mass index. But so here you have uh, different categories just for you to have an idea. So what is considered as the normal range is a body mass index between 18.5 and 25. 25 to 30 is called overweight. And everything that is above 30 is obesity with different categories class 1, class 2, class 3. Class 3 is over 40. So it's about 110 kilos for 1 meter 70 or something like that. So, so these are the different categories that are used, universally used, both in men and women, which uh, can be criticized. But this is important because then we will talk about the prevalence of uh, obesity. So this is just to, to show you where, where does it come from, the, the body mass index. So I don't know, uh, are there students from Belgium here? No? Nobody from Belgium. So this comes, so yes. Yes. Yeah, so you're, you're perfectly right. So uh, what I would say, it's a very useful index, but it's a very imperfect index, okay? So it's mostly used for populations, but we need it. We, we need an indicator to compare populations. So for this, I think it's useful. But of course it can be criticized because it does not take into account the composition of body weight, as you mentioned, uh, body weight is composed of uh, fat mass, but also non-fat mass or muscle mass. But this is more like individual, like uh, individual uh, aspect of, of the definition. So uh, my view is that uh, if we can do better, if we can really assess, for example, fat mass, then we can we can really rely on our definition, increase fat mass with negative health consequences. But for assessing populations, it still remains a useful indicator. That's my view, but it's, it's also the consensus, okay? Yes. Um, <coughs> I have a question actually relating to just a couple of slides back where we were talking about socioeconomic factors and their um, impact on someone's health and I guess by extension their BMI as well. So at the moment, especially particularly in like advanced economies, I'd say like we live in an age where you don't necessarily have to be wealthy in order to be able to consume enough calories to become obese. Whereas in the past that wouldn't have been the case. And then as we progress through this century, there'll be many developing countries where people all of a sudden will have the means to be able to afford 
bad thing, you know, have an unhealthy diet. And so in developing countries, you might see an increase in obesity. How do you guys see essentially like projections for how the average person might look physically over the course of the next century? That's an excellent question. It's just a few slides ahead oh. of, of the... <laughs> I will come back to that. We can discuss that. It's, that's an excellent point. So just to tell you that uh, it's, it's uh, yeah, the, the body mass index comes from uh, this guy uh, who is uh, considered as a hero, hero in statistics in Belgium and uh, who actually was one of the first to describe the, uh, the distribution of variables in, uh, in biology uh, relying on uh, measuring weight and height in different populations. But it's about 200 years ago, so it's, it's not new, it's not new. Uh, okay, so global spread. So this is to show you the uh, trends in obesity prevalence. So we take our cutoff of BMI over 30, and we look at the percentage, the prevalence of the population in a given country that is considered as obese. And here it's uh, from OECD, goes from 1970, 1980 to uh, at least 2020. So you can see there are wide differences between countries, really important differences. It's not always easy to explain these differences, by the way. So there is a champion here, of course, the USA, but not far from the US, Mexico. <laughs> So you have a group of countries with relatively really high prevalences. It's uh, reaching 35%, even more in the US, uh, as I will show you in a minute. And then you have, so these are developed countries, right, OECD. But uh, you have also a group of countries with lower prevalences, such as France, Italy, Switzerland. And you can see that now, in the 2020s, in France, for example, it's about 15, 17% of the population. One in six people is considered as obese. We have reached the same prevalence as the US in the 1980s, okay? So we are following the steps, but with, a, well, perhaps 30 years lag. So we will see if the projections uh, are true. Well, projections, it's always difficult, of course. But this is to show you there is an increasing trend. And in France, it has doubled in the past uh, 20 years. So this is the same. So uh, <coughs> Francoise explained to you the global burden of disease. So they, uh, they collect tons of data on global health. And so they have produced also data on obesity. And so here, uh, <coughs> this is uh, the prevalence of obesity over time from the 1980s to 2015. So it's the same, it's increasing. And here you can see, so the dotted line are the, w are the females and the solid lines, the males. So there is a difference. More females are obese than men. And then there is a breakdown by a socio-demographic index. That's what they call a socio-demographic index. It's an indicator which is mixing education, income, and fertility. So I'm not going to explain the indicator, but you can see that, uh, so relating to your question, that uh, the prevalence is much higher in uh, countries with a higher development index. And so this brings me to the answer to your question, <laughs> which is the changes uh, over time through development of the prevalence of obesity related to socioeconomic status. So I don't know if you can see the slide, but here you have different stages. So stage one is really in countries who have a low level of development. So, uh, and here the prevalence is relatively low. It's still higher in women than in men, but obviously those with a higher socioeconomic status have a higher prevalence. Possibly they can eat more and they have a different life. 
And then it goes uh, that this is also true in stage two, so higher level of development, and still there is higher prevalence in those with a higher socioeconomic status. And then you, the situation we are now in developed countries is that the prevalence is higher in women, but it's also much higher in those with low socioeconomic status. And what we can hope is that the prevalence will decrease and that the differences between socioeconomic status uh, categories will lower. I'd, just before I, I, so just to tell you that there is no country in the world where the prevalence of obesity has decreased, except Cuba when there was a famine, okay? So this is quite important to, to have in mind, yes. Very good question. We will see that in the in the in a few slides. Okay, I'm going to talk about the ultra processed foods. Does it mean yeah. That the United States are still an underdeveloped country. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I don't know. So this is just to show you the map. So this is a, a 2015, but it's it's quite the same now. It's just a bit worse. So the more red, the highest the prevalence. And the dark red is higher than 35%. So one in three person is considered as, as obese. And you can see that uh, the states here, but also uh, South Africa, and a number of countries here, such as uh, Saudi Arabia and also Turkey, are dark red. Other countries are uh, orange, such as uh, South America, and uh, also some countries uh, here in the eastern part of Europe. So this is the, and you can see the very big differences between countries. So it's national prevalence of uh, obesity. In women and in men, it's a bit different. So it's a bit lower. There is much, there is more blue here, but uh, it's becoming more and more orange and red, but it's it's clearly the same the same trends. So um, so this is the the, the global picture, and uh, this is just to show you the the latest figures I know about the U.S. So uh, so now the prevalence of obesity BMI over 30 in the U.S. is overall 42 percent. 42%. And you can see there is a breakdown here by gender and by ethnicity that the prevalence, the highest prevalence, is seen in, in black American women, black African women. So here uh, it's 58%. So BMI over 30. So it's more than, uh, more than half of, of, of this uh, group that is considered as obese, which is uh, quite uh, impressive. So uh, just to, to, um, to show you that uh, indeed obesity has a strong impact on health. So of course you may know this, but this is just to show you that it has many impacts on the major non-communicable diseases that we talked about. So it increases the risk of diabetes, high blood pressure, dyslipidemia, which are all risk factors for cardiovascular disease. It also leads to lung disease, especially what we call sleep apnea. It can also lead to liver, metabolic liver disease. 
It has a strong impact on joints with arthritis, and there are at least 15 cancers where the, the risk of cancer is increased with uh, obesity. So it really leads to a high uh, health uh, burden. And this is the classical f uh, c uh, relation between BMI and death. So it's a kind of U-shape or G-shape relation. You can see that uh, here it's the BMI, and this is the curve that has uh, given the cutoffs that we discussed. So you can see the lower risk is between 18 and 25, and then it increases over 25, over 30, over 40. So this curve is the basis for the thresholds we discussed about BMI. And you can see that any, at any given BMI, it's uh, better to be a female than a male for the risks uh, associated with uh, obesity. So this I will, uh, I will skip because we don't have much time. Just to tell you that if you try to compute the number of ye uh, um, life years lost associated with the diseases uh, related to obesity, depending on the, your age group, but it's at least five years of life lost when you have a uh, class three uh, obesity. So this is not, uh, this is not negligible. Uh, and of course, it's not only the quantity of life, but it's the quality of life. And here, so these are the different cutoffs for the BMI. And this is the increase in uh, disability adjusted life years. And you can see that there is an increase already in the overweight category. Not only the obese category, the overweight category. And the orange here is cardiovascular disease. So cardiovascular disease is really one of the main uh, bird health burden associated with obesity. So now the determinants. So I will try to go quickly because we want to have time for discussion, I think. Yes. But uh, <laughs> yes, half hour for everything. Okay. So if I have five to seven minutes, yeah, it would be great. <laughs> so just to show you how we can conceptualize the drivers, the influences, the factors that lead to obesity. So we can, we can think about a kind of linear model. So of course we are interested in obesity because it leads to all these health uh, consequences. Obviously it's related to energy balance. So, but it's also related to a number of other physiological mechanisms like inflammation, insulin resistance, etc. So this energy balance, it strongly depends on behavior. So for example, high food and energy consumption and low physical activity. And this is determined by our food and physical activity environment which is determined, as you know very well, by the policy and economic systems and the growth that is uh, leading to uh, shaping our food and physical activity environment. So perhaps obesity, it's a kind of, uh, of, uh, of uh, negative effect of, of growth in a way, as we saw in the staging uh, uh, slide. So now we can think another, another way. So we try to see what is how the factors are uh, related one to the other. So this is, perhaps you're familiar with that, this is uh, what we call the socio-ecological model applied to, to health uh, behaviors. So we have the individual, its uh, immediate environment, the social environment, the political policy environment. So this is very interesting, but we, we lack arrows here because we don't know exactly what is impacting on what. And so there is a group of uh, colleagues in uh, England that have tried to map all the factors that have been associated with obesity and all the relations between these factors. And this is it. This is the map systems map. 
So it's not really workable. At the, at the center here, you have the energy balance. This is the engine. You cannot escape the physical laws. So energy balance is at the center. It does not explain much. It's just the engine here. Fortunately, when you do some cluster analysis, you can see that what leads to obesity is related to food consumption and food production, to physical activity and, and the built environment, psychology, societal influence, and some biology. So this is a safer zone for us. But these are the factors. So now, in two minutes, we're going to address some of these factors. So our food environment has really, really is changing very rapidly. We need to know that. So what is impacting on the obesity risk is these kind of factors. Portion size. This is the Coke bottle that, uh, well, sometimes we have in cafes, but this is the original Coke bottle. And this is what you can get for a few cents. So you can see the increase in portion size. We are very interested in what we call caloric density. So caloric density is the number of calories per gram of food. So some foods have lower caloric density, such as vegetables. And there is a strong relationship between caloric density and caloric cost, meaning that those foods with the highest caloric density are the lowest uh, in price. Okay, so this is, a, this is a problem. Of course, this impacts on our food choices. And then we have the ultra-processed foods. Hello, I'm answering your question now. <laughs> so you may know this classification. So this is the NOVA classification of processed foods. So there are four, four categories. So it's been... Uh, uh, created by a colleague in Brazil, Professor Montero. And so it goes from raw foods to ultra-processed foods, mostly industrial food, UPFs. And uh, as you know, and uh, I think this is what, uh, the sense of your question, uh, there is an increasing contribution of these foods to our daily uh, intake, energy intake, and uh, there are quite a lot of differences also across countries here. So it goes from, uh, so actually Mexico is relatively low, although the prevalence of obesity is high, but you can see in the US it's 60% of daily energy intake represented by ultra-processed foods. Ultra-processed foods have a myriad of negative health consequences including weight gain, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, in many studies. Ultra-processed foods are also associated with increased energy intake. When you are offered a diet rich in ultra-processed foods compared to a diet that is made of raw foods, so this is experimental studies, in 20 people over 15 days offered the different types of food, those on the UPF diet, they ate 500 kcal more than the others, and they gained weight. So this is really important to take into account. I hope I answered your question. Not really. Okay. <laughs> and then, of course, we have to take into account uh, the living environment, the built environment. So I'm not going into the details of that, but uh, of course, the urban design, green space, transport system, they do impact on our daily physical activity. For example, walkability. I don't know if you're familiar with the concept of walkability. Walkability means it's easy to go from one place to the other by foot. It's, uh, and, uh, and so we can define the walkable and non-walkable neighborhoods, for example. And very interestingly, walkability has been related to obesity. This is a study in Canada with a 10 years follow-up. So I will just explain in one sentence. 
And what has been shown in this study is that it's only in those neighborhoods that were the most walkable that the prevalence of obesity did not increase, taking into account the socioeconomic status of all these uh, neighborhoods. And I'll, I'll go to the conclusion. So, so I think what is really important is to understand that individual approaches for such global health problems, it just does not work. But individual approaches, this is where we have the most evidence. But this is also, if we focus on individual approaches only, this is where there is the highest risk of widening inequalities. And so we want to go upstream to really tackle the structural drivers of global health problems such as obesity. And this is, this is the difficult part. Of course, many of the, uh, of the uh, actions that are uh, proposed for the prevention of obesity are easy to understand. These are what, what is called the WHO best buys for the prevention of obesity. So restriction of marketing of foods on TV. It's easy to write down, but it's very, very complicated to implement. Taxes. So there are a number of countries where there are taxes on sugar, sweetened beverages. Uh, labeling. I don't know if you discussed that, but labeling like the Nutri-Score that we have in France and in Europe. There are very, very difficult fights around labeling. So there are lobbies against labeling. Limiting portion size, as I showed you, might be also a, a strategy and facilitate access uh, to safe place for physical activity. So these are the type of ideas that are needed to try to tackle such a global health problem as uh, obesity. Thank you. Questions? Good evening. Uh, I'm Nikhil Rampal. I am from India. And uh, very nice presentation on a very relevant topic, obesity. And I opened the Financial Times today, and there was a story that how the US obesity pandemic or problem might have peaked. And now they're talking about Ozempic, which unfortunately I didn't find a mention in the presentation. But Ozempic being called a miracle drug and do you think that all the policy directions that the WHO recommends versus Ozempic? What's, what's the way out for this? Yeah, that's a good question. So, uh, so I don't know if everyone is familiar with Ozempic. So Ozempic is uh, what we call a GLP-1 analog. So it's a drug that is designed, it was initially designed to treat diabetes. And uh, in the studies that were performed with uh, people with diabetes, it was uh, found that there was a very strong effect on weight loss. And so it's uh, now marketed both for diabetes and uh, obesity. But here it's very different. It's a very different topic. So here we are talking about treating persons who live with obesity. So it's different. So what I'm talking about is prevention of weight gain and obesity. So Ozempic, it's to treat. It's not to prevent, right? So, uh, so uh, I don't know if I, you, you see what I mean. I mean, it's not the same topic, actually. So for the treatment of persons who have obesity, it's a, it's a revolution. It's a completely new way of uh, dealing with uh, persons who have obesity. Because the weight loss that is induced by these uh, drugs is, uh, so it's about 15% of uh, initial weight, which is quite substantial, actually. So if you weigh 100 kilos, it's 15 kilos. So it's quite substantial. And, and they, they work well and with few side effects. Because in the past, there has been a lot of drugs to treat uh, obesity, but it's, it's a history of horrors. 
because all of these drugs have had so bad side effects they ha they were withdrawn from the from the market so this one is is an interesting one but the question is this will not this will not prevent the 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 increase in body weight this will help those who have excess body weight to lose a few kilos but they will have to stay on the medication if they don't want to regain the weight lost the okay so there is a, a big question about the cost so for example here in france uh, it's not reimbursed it's not reimbursed well, it's not authorized it will be on the 8th of october in four days but it will not be reimbursed so you have to pay 300 euros for the drug so no for a month, a month. every month okay. it's a weekly injection okay okay juan fernando you at one point if you want uh, i put you on the screen so if you want at one point to to say something do not hesitate um hello okay. um okay hello i'm chandni i'm from india and my question is so you mentioned bmi briefly right um i recently was in india and i had a i had a health checkup and I got to know that there is an Indian BMI standard, which is lesser than the standard standard, right? My question is, do you think there is a requirement for standardization, or do you think that every country needs to develop their own standards? Yeah, it's a good question. So actually, what is uh, well accepted is that, I did not address that, but there are specific BMI cutoffs for Asian populations. So, because it's known that mm. in Asian populations, which is a vague term, but uh, this is how it is, the, the percentage of body fat in body weight is usually higher at lower BMI, okay? So, uh, so you ca can have a BMI of 25, but you have more fat than in Caucasian populations. And also, it's known that complications develop earlier than uh, BMI 25. So the cutoffs are lower. Okay, so uh, for example, in Asian populations, the cutoff for obesity is 25. It, it might be the same for India. Because in India, obesity and diabetes are enormous public health problems. And the cutoffs are lower because of these reasons. Yeah. Uh, Juan Fernando, please. Yes. Uh, it was a very typical topic of this seminar, the point raised by, by, by Jean Michel and the question about the drugs to treat. Very important about uh, economic drivers, political drivers on market access of critical access. Clearly, uh, as said by Dr. Michel, that there is not universal position about regulatory and market approval, but also about reimbursement and market adoption. And this reflects the disparities of authorities to approve and to reimburse a product for this kind of obesity. In other words, countries are putting more and more in balance the, the not the pure biomedical circumstances around obesity, but more pressure on, 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 in, on population, political, social determinants to modify eating behaviors. So I think that this point is very related with, your, with the topic of this seminar. And the political determinants can modify the, the statements and the state's decisions to reimburse with the, the, the national income something that is totally associated with nothing to do with uh, biology per se, but more associated with uh, political and social behaviors. It's a very interesting topic of debate, uh, as you mentioned. Um, hi, I'm Chitnayan from India. Um, I just have a clarification question. So the map that you showed, uh, showed like the blue map, uh, which was counting for obesity, across the globe. Uh, it, the map was more bluer for sub-Saharan and South Asian countries. Um, does 
but, but these countries are also uh, one of the highly malnourished countries. So just uh, does the obesity map uh, count for this malnourishment? Because I mean, if we're, we're looking at the whole uh, range, then the blue can just simply be because of malnourishment. Uh, is it just, is it, does the map account for that or not? So, so this is really highly relevant. So uh, of course, so, but in the next seminar, we will be able to address malnutrition because, of course, you have to take into account both problems. I mean, malnutrition or malnutrition and obesity. Uh, obesity is kind of malnutrition in a way, okay? But uh, undernutrition, so you're referring to undernutrition. Of course, and this is because of the, of the staging. I mean, the, the, the graph with the different stages of development and the prevalence of obesity is really key. So your question was, was also highly relevant. So, of course, but um, increasingly what we can see is the coexistence of undernutrition and obesity. And sometimes even in the same family, you can see children who are undernourished and also uh, parents who have uh, obesity. So, and you can also be in the obese state and be undernourished. So it's, it's, it's more complicated than just one side and the other. But this is highly relevant. And there are also uh, figures or data that have been released and analyzed by the Global Burden of Disease uh, Group about the combined impact of undernutrition and obesity. So increasingly, it's really seen as a combined global health problem. Hi, thank you so much for this. Um, I have Oh, um, I'm Haley from the US. I have a bit of a broader question, or I'd be keen to get your reflections on the public health sector internationally, more generally after the pandemic. Have there been any major shifts in the way that public health um, exists institutionally? I mean, we saw so much uh, vaccine nationalism and so much of kind of the politicization of health and everything. Has any of that changed? Um, and if so, yeah, what has or, or why not? This, this is really a, a good question. So, um, well, I think like uh, in many uh, sectors of uh, society, well, uh, sometimes things have gone back to what they used to be before the pandemic. But I think that, uh, but Françoise might have her, her ideas about, about this, that it has really, uh, I think, stimulated international cooperation and also uh, changed the, the way we see uh, the epidemics. And also uh, it has promoted the idea of, uh, of uh, human health and animal health as uh, being uh, really uh, uh, tightly uh, interconnected. And uh, some, I think some things have uh, uh, evolved in the in the in the in the way that there there is much more collaboration, I would say. But uh, if you look at the healthcare sector, it has not changed much, I would say, since the the pandemic. But but uh, on the other way, the pandemic has, I think, deeply affected certain age groups and especially those young adults, they have suffered perhaps the most of, uh, of the long-term consequences of the pandemic. But perhaps... Uh, uh, you, can, you can switch on your mic and... Yeah. You can switch on your mic, Juan Fernando. Yes. Clearly, as proposed by Jean-Michel, after the COVID, uh, global health and public is, is trying to be uh, revised because uh, in, in general we try to say today that there are three disruptions 
for the trends of the future of global health after pandemic. <coughs> Basically, is we try to, to develop that we call dignity-based practice for global health in order to lose the economization of, of public health, as mentioned by, by Francois. Second disruption is to have more to empower population, to empower population, and not only think about real pure profit in healthcare of uh, industrial actors or pure publications of academics trying to work together in order to create cooperation. And third, to have more local uh, contributions from participative actions for, from patients and society. These three disruptions are in the scope of challenges that uh, experts are more and more addressing. First of all, implicate more and more communities for, uh, for solutions and actions starting by applying methods of the research in local initiatives. Third, second, to create, to create conditions to reduce the inequities by, by in connecting different partners. And this is very important because today the global community about global health is today very close. So we need to create more open science and invite different economic stakeholders. So I think that there, there is very good perspectives and, and third, multidimensional models, including systemic, systemic thinking, as uh, the, the graph that Jean-Michel showed you from the from United Kingdom, show the, the huge landscape uh, with clusters of parameters that we can influentiate not only from a scientific point of view, but from population citizens' point of view, and of course, uh, public private partners. So, this is something that is crucial for the next trends in global health, and is why our government is working with you and to create more um, outreach vision of how we can address this, these topics and select one topic and develop actions with very participative actions in how to measure. The problem is how to measure effectively the impact for populations on a sustainable way. Uh, yes. Uh, what I could say about your question, which is very interesting, that if uh, a COVID-19 scientific, uh, the scientific cooperation that occurred during the COVID-19 pandemic has been unprecedented, mm -hmm. and this led to a major breakthrough in vaccine. Of course, the uh, the vaccine has been uh, the research work has been ongoing for almost 30 years on the uh, mRNA, mRNA uh, vaccine, but the, the level of cooperation worldwide between uh, uh, um, scientific teams about you know sharing banks of viruses. And, and genotyping and following the data, the data work, data science work that's been going on. It's what, uh, in a, such a short uh, a period of time, it, it really saved life. And uh, of course, we have all been, uh, um, uh, I, I would say, uh, we have seen a lot of disinformation about vaccine, uh, but you know, uh, we were talking about achievement in global health, and uh, uh, life has double, life expectancy has doubled, and and uh, c uh, children under five live live past the year of of five thanks to vaccines. So this uh, level of of cooperation is a true and and, uh, and and wonderful example in collaboration in global health, and it was coming from many parts of the world. Hello, my name is Matilda, I'm from Germany. Um, I wanted to ask uh, again about the obesity topic. Um, it seems sort of it's commonly known that obesity is very unevenly distributed across class, race, income and education. And because of that, I also wanted to ask if maybe rather than having policies which tackle it just as a health issue or kind of looks at the food environment in a very general way, not differentiating that different people are exposed to different food environments, doesn't that imply that maybe sort of just classic social policies might be some of the most effective ways to tackle obesity? And if so, could we mobilize health as a sort of justification also for some of these social policies? Anything from improving education, improving um, work and labor rights, improving incomes, anything which sort of on a more progressive policy person would support yeah of course you're right it's part of it 
but there are specific policies that have to address the food environment. And so this is more than uh, education, for example, uh, providing, providing access to healthy foods. It needs uh, specific policies. For example, you can think about uh, promoting, uh, promoting fruits and vegetables, or you can provide perhaps coupons uh, sometimes to, to those who, are, who, are, who cannot afford the fruits and vegetables. So these are, uh, I, I don't think it's, it's, it's more specific to, to the food environment. But the food environment, it's, it's uh, quite complicated because um, uh, I think there is a very clear relation between the built environment and physical activity, for example. It's very well known, and here in Paris we have experienced that. You have more bike lanes, so the number of bike lanes has doubled since the COVID, and, and you have much more people cycling. So there is a very strong relationship between the local built environment and the physical activity you do. For food, it's different because people can travel to get their food and to get the, uh, the less expensive food, for example. But what is offered is really what you eat. So you really have to think about what is offered, how it is presented, and uh, it's, it's more than edu education and inf information. Of course, labeling is, is very important. And the proof is that there is so much lobbying against it that it must be useful. Yeah. Last question. Lou from France. I wanted to add on what Matilda was saying. Um, I'm starting to work on a pilot project in Bordeaux on la sécurité sociale de l'alimentation, so food guarantee where everyone can get 150 euros per month to have access to food, speci uh, specifically healthy food. And that does work in a city where people have globally access to the same kind of like <coughs> health store throughout the city, but I spend a lot of time in Canada, in North America, you have a lot of food deserts, especially in black and brown communities and indigenous communities. So it's it, it like sometimes you have to travel an hour to have access to a health store in certain communities. So it's not only uh, a question of price and like close environments, also a question of, of race and st structures that are built in uh, that favorize obesity. And I wanted to know like what kind of policies do you think could help tackle these very systemic issues? Uh, so I, I'm not sure about your example, so in, uh, I'm not sure that uh, what is uh, the, the way the food environment is organized uh, in North America can be really compared to, to Europe. I think it's so different. So the, the, the issue of food deserts, it, it, you cannot translate uh, the concept of food desert as it has been developed in the States uh, to or North America to what we see here. So, but I think that um, well, what you say about uh, Sécurité Sociale des Aliments and all these initiatives, really to promote and to give access to uh, healthy food, uh, this, this is key. And then you have for example, I have worked with uh, geographers, and so it's really interesting to map where are the food uh, shops, for example, and so the food shops are not located uh, by chains. I mean, they are located at strategic uh, locations where people will come easily, etc. So you have to think about uh, where the food uh, resources uh, are implemented, and this can be perhaps helped by uh, regulation. So at some point, you have really to ask the question about regulation. So what I showed you in the last slide, it's all about regulation. So taxes, so even if you want a free world, then uh, the free world is, uh, okay, producing growth, but it's also producing obesity. <laughs> so at some point, I think you need regulations, and uh, regulations also for the local 
uh, implantation of, the, the, of these uh, food uh, resources. I want to thank Françoise, Jean-Michel and Juan Fernando. Thank you very much, and so you have other topics to investigate.